So the human society, we, we need to base it on the human being, not on the world of animals, and also not just on intellectual uh, or even mathematical um, abstractions. And that means that which we all have, the human, uh, the three human realms, the cultural life, the rights life, and the economic life, based on the nervous system, the circulatory system, and the metabolic system. Um, and that those three social systems, just as the three systems in our body, are separate but interconnected. So, not confused, they each have their own independent place and need to operate in the way which is appropriate to them. And not be interfering with each other or dominating each other. Um, I wonder if I perhaps should just stop for a minute there before I, before I go on. Because it, it's, that's maybe a little summary point. Maybe ask if there are any, any points of clarification you, you, you want before I go on with that. Is there something which is not quite clear or something that's bothering you? Well, I was just wondering if you see any streams at the moment, anybody has any vision of this reality? Well, about anything? Yeah, I mean, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, you've got the, um, you have the example of the, the Labour Party in Britain saying for the first time um, the teachers should be left to teach and the politicians should not get into their hair. You've got the young people, the Occupy movement, saying money should be separated from politics. You've got um, uh, demonstrators on the streets of uh, Sao Paulo and in Turkey saying we've had enough of political parties. Political parties are a system whereby um, a small committee or a elite or perhaps one leader determines a manifesto which everybody then signs up for and you've got a party line and you get a party whip. So you know, where's the individual initiative in that? You're forced as a politician to follow that line. So it's, again it's an 18th century concept. Political parties really go back in European history to the 18th century and have spread out um, throughout Europe and the West from that time. And we're still trying to operate that today. I think everybody somehow feels that political parties, nothing much can be expected from them anymore, but we haven't, it's as if we just can't imagine any other way to run politics, except with parties. But after all, there was a time when there weren't any political parties. So, everything comes to an end, and new things can develop. So can we not imagine a way in which politics could be ordered differently without falling back into dictatorship? You know, if we all spent five minutes of every day just thinking, what could we have instead of political parties? But, I mean, we had in the 60s, we had an, an out-of-parliamentary opposition mm -hmm. in Germany, in France, yeah, and yeah. in many places yeah. in America. Yeah. The students started to organize themselves. So, but, you know, it was a big thing, push. Mm -hmm. But then it sort of, yeah. it peters out. That's right. It's the forces are too strong. People go through it. Then there's the marshal and institutions and all these ideas. That, uh, uh, but in the end, it seems like the structure is too strong. You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. it has it has its own momentum. Sure, it does. Mm -hmm. And then it's the only question. I mean, the the, the powers that be become enormous. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the amount of capital that is concentrated is just beyond belief. Well, like, right. yeah. like the Soviet Union, for example. Yeah. And where is that today? But, okay. You know, like Nazi Germany, and where is that today? I mean, all these dictatorships in the end <coughs> collapse. It's just a case of how long they're going to be with us. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's just a case of how, how quickly uh, we can, as it were, wake up to how did these forces arrive? How did we let them arrive? Remember that when I showed you about Mr. Juncker? We put that out there, and we wait, and we see how the people respond. And if they don't respond, we take the next step. So in a sense, that is the, it's almost quite a deep philosophical thing if you think about it. That in order for freedom to exist, one needs opposition. One needs the opposition from the elite for us to develop our consciousness and wake up to social, healthy social reality. And the elites are always trying to drag us back into these old forms of the age of the priesthood or the age of the monarch or the age of, you know, the aristocracy or something. These old forms control from behind the scenes. Um, they're always trying to do that. And the question
question is, can we see through what they are actually doing? And I think we can take heart in that area, that a lot of seeing through has, has happened. Um, for example, if you go back just 15 years, probably anybody in the mainstream, uh, people who are looking at mainstream media, were aware of an organization like the Bilderberg Group. Who? The Bilderberg Group. <laughs> <laughs> the Bilderberg Group. Yes. The Bilderberg Group, right? Founded in 1954 in order to keep Europe in line with the United States to fight the Soviet Union. In order to create the European Union. To control things from behind the scene. Please don't take my word for this. this is, you find loads of stuff on this on, online if you go into the history of the Bilderberg Group. Right? There are meetings, clandestine meetings, which are not reported in the mainstream press. They went on every year, meeting in various places. Key members of the European and American um, academia, military, politicians, business leaders, and so on. The top, top people. And they would meet in utter secrecy, guarded by taxpayer money, in the various countries. And these meetings would be never reported. Even though a magazine like The Economist of London, one of the top uh, British media organs, would always have two so-called rapporteurs at these meetings. Yeah? But they didn't rapport to anybody except the, the people who were at the meetings. They didn't tell their own readers what went on at these meetings. But now, through the efforts of uh, independent and alternative researchers and investigators, this group has been, as it were, forced out into the open. So now even the BBC are forced to recognise the existence of this group. So step by step, we, the people, as it were, are becoming more and more aware, and certainly the internet has helped a lot in this, of what, the, um, what these forces, these old retarding forces, are doing. Yeah? But without those retarding forces, we don't actually have any freedom, because you only get your freedom from resistance. It's a question of struggle and growth. So they have their role to play. Sense, yeah? So I think those people in the alternative circles who like to hate them are profoundly mistaken. You know, these are pluralists or elitist bastards or whatever, you know. They, they, go, they rail on about these groups. And yeah, of course, the, some of the things they get up to, the wars they start and cause and so on, but this is all part of the process of us finding our own freedom as individuals and communities. So they've got that role to play. Any other yeah. um, Maybe I won't go too, too far into it, but just to indicate, this is really something from um, the, the book by Johannes Rowan, Functional Threefolds in the Human Organism and the Human Society, where he's, see, where is it now? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, look at the threefold nervous system, and you've got the, the three parts of the nervous system, the central nervous system, the sense organs, the spinal cord, and the autonomous, the autonomic nervous system. And if you look at the metabolic system, you've got the gastrointestinal tract, you could say energy enters in, yes? You've got the abdominal organs, and you've got the organs of movement and reproduction, energy exits, so to speak. In the circulatory system, you've got the upper part aspect of the circulatory system, the middle rhythmical system, and the upper blood in the metabolic system. So there's kind of a threefoldness in each one of these three systems. And if we look at how that applies in society, we see in the politi political area, the political key is really the idea of equality. In the political realm, what you have inside you, as an individual, is irrelevant. The only thing that's important in this realm is you're a human being, I'm a human being. It doesn't matter if you're a woman and I'm a man, you're, you know, on this country, country uh, sorry, you're of this race or that race, all that matters is we're human beings. And as human beings, we have equal rights in a particular society, yeah? So the, what's inside you, in that sense, is not important. With equal rights and equal responsibilities simply by virtue of the fact that we are human beings before the law. Hence, equality before the law. Um, so you've got the various uh, principles and functions and institutions in the political area, which you can see there. 
the, the courts, the parliament, and then the executive function, civil service, police, and military. Yeah? Um, perhaps just if I just say a word about the courts, because I think here's an important point. If we talk about equality um, before the law, which I'm sure everybody here would subscribe to, uh, how is it equal if, for example, you have, in, for example, in Australia today, you have a situation where um, a farmer um, finds that he has oil on his land, which is available through fracking. You, you're familiar with it, yeah? And, um, and an oil company comes along in Australia and says, well, we want to, we want to frack your oil, we want to get at your oil. And the farmer says, no thanks, I'm not interested. And then the, the, the oil corporation then hires some really high-powered lawyers at extremely high cost. Well, who is the farmer then hire to defend his rights? Well, he can only get maybe the local legal aid lawyer or perhaps you know, a struggling you know, young lawyer or whoever it is, right? Aaron, Aaron Brockovich. Sorry? <laughs> Aaron Bro Yeah, this kind of thing. You see the problem there. Again, money in the law. How can you have equality before the law if lawyers are private working for themselves? Right? So there is an argument to be made there that lawyers actually ought to be state employees in order to work equally for all citizens, which at the moment they don't. If you can afford it, you can hire in, in my country a top Queen's Council, QC lawyer. You know, those people are really high powered. So if you just got a local solicitor, you're not going to get much chance, probably. So the money is there determine, determining your rights before the law. This can't be right. You know? But it's so deep rooted in us that the law, lawyers, should be private, like in the cultural realm, yeah, where it's individual, like artists and teachers and so on, that lawyers also should be like that. Well, I think that's something we should think about if we really want to be concerned to get money out of the legal system yeah, and start thinking in terms of lawyers being uh, state employees and serving everybody in the community. So anybody can expect to get an equally trained lawyer. Um, teachers should not be state employees. That's in the cultural realm. And that's not where the state belongs. That's not the realm of rights and responsibilities. The only right and responsibility there is that a, a child has a right to an education. But beyond that, the state should not be telling the teachers what to teach. So it shouldn't control what the teachers teach. And therefore, teachers should not ultimately be state employees. Um, the cultural sphere, as you see there again, it's a threefold division. You've got science and research corresponding in a sense to the nervous system part of the cultural sphere. You've got the arts, education and healthcare corresponding um, to the circulatory aspect. There's always a threefold element in each of these three realms. And then you've got um, innovators, scientists, religious people involved in the metabolic area, yeah, where they work out um, in a practical way, so to speak. But the basic principle in the cultural area is freedom, is liberty. That's where liberty belongs, and that's also where competition belongs in the cultural sphere, and where hierarchy also belongs. Right? If you're going to go and go to a music concert, don't you want the best? Well, perhaps if it's your family performing, you're happy to go and listen to them, right? But normally we, we like to find the best, do we not? Yeah? That's where the individual talents of the individual, the capacities of the individual, really, we, we appreciate that, and that's what we want to, we want to um, uh, experience. So, competition, freedom, and hierarchy belong in this realm, and not in the economic realm, and not in the uh, political realm. In the economic sphere, the same threefold division, yeah? In the upper sphere, consumption, so you've got consumption, distribution and market, and production. Um, the principle here is cooperation. Uh, but each slightly different in each case. Yeah? Cooperation of consumption, for example, we today have a healthy development, which they didn't have in Steinstein, like 
consumer organizations. They didn't have those 100 years ago. We've developed them since. That's another example you see how associations are being formed of consumers. Associations are emerging of distributors and associations are emerging of producers and manufacturers. People are beginning to cooperate. But you might say, yes, but that means cartels. Manufacturers get together and fix the market. Yeah, sure, they do that because we're still based on this principle I mentioned before. It's all out for me, right? The principle of cooperation has not yet been taken seriously at a conscious level. Nevertheless, because this is definitely happening subconsciously, we see that manufacturers do begin to work together in association with each other in chambers of commerce and um, uh, different industrial organizations of business people involved in the same area of the economy, of production and manufacture. So these are developments which have happened over the last hundred years, heading in this direction. It's going to take time. Um, the economy as it relates to the human organism. So you see there, again, consumption, distribution, trade and market, production, and how these connect to these three parts of the human physiology. The central nervous system, the spinal cord, and the autonomic nervous system. Metabolism and culture. Um, forgive me, I'm going through this rather quickly, but um, you see there are the three parts of the uh, metabolic system and how these correspond in a certain sense to research, education in the arts, and applied science, technology, and religion. So there, as it were, researchers are taking things in from the outer world and uh, developing ideas in response to those. But the main aspect of the metabolic, the metabolic region is, is really this area in the cultural sphere. Yeah? The, 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 real, the real metabolic area is economics. But as I've said, each one of these areas is actually related to a certain aspect of our uh, human physiology. The political and circulatory system, so this is the real the circulatory system, is the real po uh, political realm, you could say. You've got, as I mentioned, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. Breathing, the heart, blood circulation, and then the immune system, nutrition, resistance. Um, and sort of summing those things up, the threefold society in relation to liberty, equality, and fraternity, the cultural sphere, the political sphere, the economic sphere, freedom, equality, and um, cooperation in those various areas that you see there. Perhaps I should just say a word about this. The judiciary, there you see, are they're in the political sphere, like the legislature and the executive or the defence, but the judiciary, the judges, are rather different from lawyers. I mean, if you can imagine how. Because a, a judge, when he or she has to, uh, for example, pass sentence, has to take into account the individual circumstances of the human being before him or her. Yeah? And when you, as soon as you begin to take into account individual circumstances, that means you begin to take into account what lives within that person. And so you're no longer operating strictly on the basis of um, the two people, the person as a human being, yeah? which is the, strictly the, the role or the realm of political rights. As I said earlier, that has nothing to do with what's inside you. Yeah? So, on the one hand, when you're talking about um, defence lawyers and prosecution lawyers, then these people are really working in the, you could say, the, strictly the strict political legal realm. That's where you're only talking about outer rights as human beings, the rights of the person before them. But when, when the judge enters in, the judge is actually considering what lives inside that person. 
So, strictly speaking, the judge, the judges are actually operating in the cultural realm. They're operating in the individual sphere. Sorry, Terry, when you say what's inside the individual, can you yeah, that expand means, a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this, I can you know, intuitively put these things together and run the analogs with the yeah. body, but it's mm -hmm. a lot. Okay. You know. It simply means, Barry, yeah. that um, when we're talking about politics and law, then you know, the fact that you're Barry and I'm Terry is irrelevant. Yeah. You know, if, we, if we were both Irish citizens, but me too, then before Irish law, it's irrelevant yeah. that you're Barry and I'm Terry and your parents are such and such and my parents are such and such and you're a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah? All that matters is you're an Irish citizen and I'm an Irish citizen. Finish. Mm -hmm. See, and the same for gender and so on and so forth, sexual orientation, etc. But when the judge is involved, then the judge has to think about, for example, when passing sentence, what is the situation of Barry's life? What is going to be good or not good for Barry, for this, for this defendant, right? What can I do to um, really assist Barry, this, this defendant, in his or her development? This is unique in this future case. Right. Yeah. So right. the judge is, yeah. that's right, that's so right. the judge is in a certain sense, he's engaging with the biography of the person. This is a Caucasian, Caucasian uh, chalk circle. Brecht? Brecht's book. Mm. Okay, but, uh, Caucasian, I mean Caucasian, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> just putting, he's putting the law at a completely different level in that moment. That's why it's so popular. They keep on playing that because it's a paradox. The judge is not deciding on the outer facts, he's deciding on how the people react towards the child, which is gets it's about the child that is being right. uh, where who should have the custody of the child. The child yeah. And he lets the people demonstrate who should have, but yeah. not out of uh, yeah. out of the law book. So he's yeah. he's making this uh, as an example of where the judge right. comes into play. Right. He's not out of the book, but, yeah. but out of a completely different run. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, it, and you know, it's like it's a bit like the famous story of King Solomon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When the two women come forward and say, "Well, it's my son, and it's my son," and King Solomon says, "I say, let's cut the baby in half then." <laughs> you know, and then of course the woman who, who's really the mother says, "Oh, in that case, give it to her. Don't cut him in half. Give it to her." And then King Solomon goes, "Ah, well, in fact." No, it's the same story. Yeah? It's, exactly, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah. So, in other words, the judge has insight into the actual who this person is. So, basically, Terry, that's someone who maybe the first offence compared to somebody who's repeated offence, offences. Yeah. That would be something yeah. that they take away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Steiner, again, you know, as I said, you know, it was under no illusion that this is, this is you know, an instant uh, panacea for our problems. He said um, in, his, in, the, in his book, The Social Future, I can well imagine that there may still be people who will say that these are only ideas and how is it possible they will ask that people can now rise to such ideas. A gulf yawns between these ideas and those generally understood in the present day. I would only remark that with regard to such opinions, our answer must be it need not concern us how advanced or otherwise people are. We need only speak out over and over again what we hold to be the truth, the truth about human nature. And what we think is likely to bear fruit, and then wait till they're understood. And if we do so, if we never tire of repeating this again and again, then people will advance more rapidly than if they are continually told about their individuality. I believe that the world may very soon be ready for such things, and I will therefore never retire of repeating over and over again that which I believe would hasten the advancement of humanity to maturity. Well, actually, at that time, in 1919, he tried in three different ways to bring this idea forward. First, he tried to contact, you could say, uh, the people at the top of society. That's, in a way, the traditional route. So he tried to contact the government people and, you know, significant aristocrats and so on. That didn't work, because those people didn't have the imagination to see what he was getting at. So that failed. So then he turned to the, the workers and uh, the, the, the unions and tried to you know, give lectures and talks to them and interest them in it. But the union leaders were so embedded in Marxist thought at that time, of course the Russian Revolution and so on, 
that um, their hold over the way of thinking of their members was, was too strong. And so then he turned to the general public and sort of toured and, and gave lectures and talks and so on. The problem there was that the economic circumstances at the time and the chaos after the First World War was so great and people's fears were so great that it was actually quite hard to, to get them to sort of free up uh, their minds to, to new ideas at that point and in fact realize that actually in times of such chaos that that's really the time when people are really open or could be open to new ideas. Yeah. So in the end, uh, by 1922, he said, and he felt that, well, this is not going to work now. So we're going to have to wait about 100 years. And in the meantime, we should try through to help at least our children to develop healthy forces of thinking, feeling, and willing through schooling. Yeah? So this was, of course, actually the, the origins of the Waldorf, the Waldorf movement in education. Um, but he did say that in about 100 years' time, we can look again at circumstances and see if then it's not a suitable time for these ideas to come forward and pe because people will be in a more receptive mood for them. Because by then, human, uh, because of the nature of the problems we have, the same problems will occur. And we'll be faced with ever worse crises. And that's certainly happened, has it not? So here we are now, in the mess we're in, the debt crisis that we're in, uh, the possibility of coming war against China, for example, uh, where, as I've said, America and Europe are drawn together by these elite forces and the possibility of another bilateral division of the world between East and West, which is obviously something we absolutely must avoid. But to do that, we've got to... Um, we've got to... Uh, and was it, sorry, yeah. and so what he wanted was for people, for liberty, equality, for fraternity to... He wanted liberty, equality, and fraternity to be understood in their right realms. So they no longer exist just as abstract formulae, yeah? but to see that, for example, the real basis of the economic life should be cooperation and not liberty of the individual, right? But we, the economic life is not to be based on I and self-assertion, but we working together in service to each other, to the community. And also, one could also add to that today especially, in service to nature as well. So we do not will, willfully pollute, we do not willfully abuse nature and so on. Yeah? We've, again, progress has been made, but we're far more aware of that today than we were in Steiner's time. Yeah? So in service to our fellow human beings, and, and at the same time in real care for the natural environment. Yeah? Uh, and then, to, yes? Just to sort of look at some of the, tease some of the ideas out that this this idea of a wage, you know, um, yeah. and that in Ireland now there's this there's a lot of um, I suppose anger about the, the, the you know the, the liberty idea where people uh, get huge wages, you know, in, in obviously in the, in the economic realm, and uh, they people feel that that it's kind of willy nilly. It's it's not it's not related to their talent. It's not related to I'm just wondering, like, you know, like this is kind of a practical thing for people, you know, mm. when they're, you know, when they're looking at these, you know, mm. these different realms, these mm. domains, mm. like this idea to come to some sort of, because um, obviously at the moment people, most people, are, like let's say in Ireland, in England, around the world, they're they're economic slaves in a way that they have they, if they feel anyway, because it's kind of an illusion. But they feel that, that their world will collapse mm. unless they have X amount of money, yeah. for example. Whereas I guess this is all heading to a place where the whatever you do is not a wage. You know, mm. you know what I mean? There's something, there's some value in what you do, and people see that. Yeah. And and that's the basis of the kind of cooperative spirit. Yes. You know, in that, because the wage you get is an illusion. Because some people let's say, get very little wages, and yet they're very good at their jobs, mm -hmm. and they have a, de you know...